Yes, I think so. Ah, yeah, I tried marijuana too. Not sure if I exhaled or not. One of the first books I read when I was a university student was Gilbert Ryle's The Concept of Mind. I gathered from that that the mind is a complicated concept. But one state of mind is an even more complicated concept. But in our everyday discourse with each other, we appear to understand the meaning of changing one state of mind. One state of mind may be changed physically. I remember when myself and my sister were young infants, you know, we turn ourselves round and round and deliberately make ourselves dizzy and collapse laughter at the resulting sensation of being giddy dizzy. Some of my friends have taken it steps further than that. Some of them bungee jump, others parachute, hang glide, climb mountains, walk tight roads, race cars. And they all claim to get really high for those activities. One state of mind may be changed spiritually. Some of my friends are high on Jesus. Others confess to priests. Some fast for 40 days. Lots of them talk to gurus. Many undergo purification rituals such as baptism or puja. Few even go on pilgrimages. One state of mind may also be changed psychologically. Some of my mates get entertained by psychiatrists, get time regressed to when they were born, or even before, get psychoanalyzed, unblocked, and claimed as a result to wave bye-bye to their neuroses. So generally, I think we can infer that changing states of mind seems to be at least permitted, if not approved, by authorities the powers that be. They have no problem with my getting high from jumping off a cliff, or getting a buzz from being zapped by a witch doctor, or being mesmerized by a hypnotist. But one is also able to change the state of one's mind chemically, through drugs, through recreational drugs. And by recreational drug, just, just to have a definition, I mean something that is ingested for purposes other than nourishment or medicine. Okay. As one can change one's state of mind chemically, and it is just another example of changing one's state of mind, one could perhaps be forgiven for assuming that authority might perhaps be equally approving, approving of this means changing one's state of mind. And it was so approving, but only for several million years or so. <laughs> there was one century that didn't approve, <coughs> the last century, but only the last century. The authorities of the last century, and disappointingly so far the current century, have a major objection to our changing the states of our minds chemically using drugs. We might wish to consider whether or not there is any understandable moral justification for this objection. Why should all recreational drug use be classified as abuse or misuse? How can one abuse or misuse something without being able somehow to use it? For the moment, I'm not asked why there was an authority in this government at this time do not wish, wish people to take recreational drugs. Let's briefly, very, very briefly, assume they have an ethical basis for preventing people from pursuing happiness in this their chosen manner. Let's assume, okay, very briefly, they can rationally defend this constraint of personal freedom. Most people take recreational drugs with the exception in some countries of alcohol and tobacco. The possession and trade of all recreational drugs have been criminalized. This strategy is called prohibition. 
prohibition renders at least some recreational drugs illegal. Vast taxpayer resources are needed to implement prohibition. These include huge budgets allocated to the police, judiciary, lawyers, prisons, doctors. These budgets are increased dramatically every year, and we taxpayers, sorry, and you taxpayers, <laughs> are paying for it. I wonder if the strategy of prohibition, prohibition is effective. Prohibition doesn't work. The sole aim and objective of prohibition is to stop people taking recreational drugs. Prohibition hasn't stopped people wanting to take recreational drugs, as Aldous Huxley once ruled. That humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. Most men and women lead lives at the worst so painful, at the best so monotonous, poor and limited, that the urge to escape is, and has always been, one of the principal appetites of the soul. There is no society anywhere in the world, nor at any time in history, that has not used an intoxicant. People enjoy getting off their faces. <laughs> there will always be a demand for drugs. Prohibition definitely has not stopped people taking Drugs, drug use has risen at a furious pace over the last 10 years. A massive percentage of the entire population of the world use recreational drugs. More people take cannabis than regularly go to church. Seven surveys of young people carried out since 1993 and I think 2007 show cannabis use, use ranging from 53% in university students to 96% in readers of a certain dance magazine. Two-thirds of all registered <coughs> voters under the age of 25 take cannabis. All have access to harder drugs if they want them. Everyone who wants to take drugs is already taking drugs. If the government cannot keep drugs out of the prisons it administers, or even out of the households of their own personnel. What hope is there of its doing so in a free society? There will, therefore, always be a supply of drugs, and people will always want to take them, and it will always be there. For the first time, I think I can speak with absolute total expertise and authority. It is easy to smuggle drugs into this country. <laughs> it is easy these days to grow some recreational drugs like mind-blown skunk in the back garden or wardrobe. People will sell drugs because it's easy. The profits are high and the risks of getting caught are pretty low. There is a high demand for drugs which is almost being supplied, but never has been. <laughs> this obviously and clearly means prohibition doesn't work, even from the prohibitionist point of view. <coughs> but prohibition 